So I wasn't going to make another list video, I had just done the uh, 10 most forgettable games of the last decade, but on request from somebody in our community, uh, I am going to do the 10 best games of the decade, knowing that that's completely arbitrary because it's from my perspective, so... I did have a bunch of honorable mentions, but I'm not going to do them in the video because it would just make it way too long and cluttered. And if you're interested in that, there is going to be a whole written piece in the listing on Delvecast, so you can go and check that out too. Same basic idea as the last one I did, we're just going to take a game from each year. And so that means that we get to start with 2010! So 2010 is going to be a really difficult year, and it's Fallout New Vegas. It's Fallout New Vegas, of course it is. Everything about New Vegas is more ambitious than Fallout 3. It's bigger, there's more content, there's more complex storylines, there is no black and white, there's only shades of gray in all of the uh, characters and the factions that you meet. All of the add-on content was great, too. They did not feel like just tacked on pieces. They really felt like their own personalities uh, inside of the game and, and whole campaigns all their own. Obsidian really outdid Bethesda with this title, really making something even more ambitious and well-written and atmospheric than Fallout 3 ever was. They did a great job building the lore and the characters. All of the NPCs are terrific in this and really feel fleshed out. So does the entire Mojave wasteland, for that matter. It's not just the best Fallout game ever made, it's one of the best RPGs ever crafted. If you have not played it before or you're interested in going back to it like I have recently, uh, pick up the Ultimate Edition, because, yeah, all of the add-on content was well worth it. Well worth your time, especially Old World Blues. Great game, even today, especially on modern systems, because it actually plays better and has uh, shorter loading screens now with new hardware. 2011! So 2011 is basically all about Skyrim, right? It, it kind of has to be. It is one of the most ambitious RPGs that has ever been made. Just bar none. It was wonderfully crafted. It is possibly one of the best games Bethesda ever made. And yeah, even by modern standards. That's why they keep releasing it over and over again. They want to say, hey, remember when we made that? Yeah, yeah, we do. Skyrim just begs you to play it in a wide variety of ways. There is no right way or wrong way to play it. It just kind of presents this large, sprawling landscape that begs you to really dive into it. And it does a great job at that as well. I mean, the storyline is very, you know, your basic high fantasy kind of story, but... I did like the ideas of having, you know, the dragonborn and that there's this ancient power and you have it inside of you and now you need to utilize it. But beyond that, it's about getting into the smaller character arcs and the different guilds and exploring these off the beaten path places out in the mountains that are the best parts of it. And they did a smart thing in Skyrim. They were coming off of Oblivion, and Oblivion had a whole system where all of the enemies and the monsters, they got more difficult when you got to be higher levels. And in Skyrim, they said, no, 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 no. Everything is just the difficulty it is, and it didn't really scale like that. The great thing about that is that when you get into the landscape, you realize that the thing that's really determining how good you are at a thing is your personal ability. Everything else is not going to mold to you, and it makes the whole thing feel like a real world that you are inhabiting. And that's the reason why it got so much praise and deserves that praise, even to this day. And the mechanics in Skyrim work so well that you will end up sinking 100 hours into it and you won't even feel the time sink. It doesn't feel artificially stretched out or grindy because there's always something to do around the corner. Very similar to New Vegas, in fact. And it does ask you to replay it in various ways, if you want to. 
That's a mark of a great game, is whether you feel compelled to replay it, and Skyrim absolutely does. 2012. So basically, Borderlands 2 came out this year, so that's my game for 2012. Basically, they took everything that worked well in the first game, and they improved upon it, and they made a richer storyline with better character development, and, you know, better graphics, better gameplay, more guns, more options for guns, better skill trees, you know, they, they just improved everything, and it worked better. You know, I stand by my statement that Borderlands is basically Diablo with guns, but I'm cool with that, and I'm cool with the rarity system, and I'm cool that they kind of get you into these risk-reward loops where you're just kind of going through that loop over and over again, but it's always satisfying, and it is basically the video game equivalent of crack. But Borderlands 2 also had serious legs, and they even made new content for it this last year, in the lead-up to Borderlands 3. People were still playing this six years, seven years after its initial release because it was really good. Even the multiplayer was satisfying, being able to go in and like four-player co-op and have more difficult enemies. They just did a really great job at Gearbox making this game, and you know what? It deserves that credit. Like, Mr. Torg and Tiny Tina alone are worth the price of admission, but Tina's Assault on Dragon Keep DLC was fantastic, and, and still stands as one of the best pieces of DLC ever made. Really added a lot to the game. The rest of it was really good, too. Don't get me wrong, but, you know, especially that, they really upped their game. And with the variety of different kinds of characters you can play with different skill trees, again, you'll want to come back to it over and over. Replayability for that game is still very high, even if you want to pick it up brand new today. 2013! Now, I had said that 2012 was a really good year for games, but I forgot that 2013 was also a seriously great year for games, so it was a little hard to pick one. But ultimately, I had to give it to Bioshock Infinite. The Bioshock series is terrific, uh, especially the first one where you get to explore Rapture for the very first time, and uh, it had some interesting uh, social commentary inside of it as well that didn't really hit you over the head, but really did present this interesting dystopic vision of something that many people might actually assume is a paradise in the making. It doesn't turn out that way for Rapture. But what they did with Bioshock Infinite was so much more ambitious, and I think they nailed it completely. That first time you get catapulted up into the clouds and see the world of Columbia, it is breathtaking. There is just no other word for it. And then when you get a feel for the society and realize that everything is not peachy and great in this world, it gives you that Bioshock feeling, but with much better gameplay, much more interesting character development, and a more personalized story. Then it gets into really heady territory about alternate dimensions and, and rifts in time space, and there's a lot of stuff going on in this, but it does make sense when you're playing it. You know, looking back on it, they weren't just throwing out a bunch of stuff. They were trying to follow by the rules that they were setting forth in the narrative. And by the end of the game, you realize that there was this large philosophical debate between the nature of destiny and chaos theory, and you're not really sure which one won in the end. They do such a good job at just keeping things moving smoothly along without feeling inundated at any time. And it just endears you to the narrative that is being propelled along by Booker and Elizabeth, and they do such a good job at just keeping you engaged and really caring what happens to them at the end. 2014! You know, I'm not going to lie, 2014 was uh, kind of a slow year when I look back on it in gaming, uh, but I feel like the one that I really have to give credit to is, surprisingly enough, South Park The Stick of Truth. Okay, I know that that's a strange one for Game of the Year, but you know, hear me out. I am a South Park fan, so I suppose I was a little predisposed to like this, but it had a really good pedigree behind it. Actually, Obsidian worked on this game. And they nailed the look of the show so well. The characters, everything. This is a case study in how to properly utilize 
a licensed franchise for a game. Moreover, they did this amazing thing where they created a great RPG while also deconstructing a lot of the tropes around RPGs. That's kind of a feat into and of itself. Because the turn-based combat and everything worked really well, but at the same time, they were making fun of so many of the common things that you see in games and progression systems. That whole thing where you have to just get more followers on your social media account in order to like gain fame is just such a, a wonderful like jab at, at like fame systems and infamy systems, etc. And your whole magic system is done with farts. Because of course it is. You can just tell that everybody that worked on this game really actually cared about the license, about the show, about the characters, that they wanted to make a great game, not just a South Park tie-in game. And it worked really well. 2015. Toss a coin to your witcher or valley of plenty. Okay, that should raise the view count. Yeah, so Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, it was a difficult year because there are a lot of really big epic games that came out in 2015, but you, you really have to give props to CD Projekt Red and what they did with Witcher 3. I mean, the game occasionally, if I had one complaint about it, Geralt can kind of move a little rigidly, when, especially when you get into fights, but that is a small inconvenience for the fact that they are able to make this grandiose landscape that isn't just like a barren world that you have to travel around in. There's just stuff around every corner. It feels actually like lived in, that this is an active, living, breathing world that you are exploring. And the side quests and all of the missions and all of the characters are written so well and have such interesting, compelling narratives that you just want to explore every nook and cranny of the world that they built. I mean, this was a game that created a mini game called Gwent that's like a standalone all its own. You, you could play that for 70 hours in the game if you wanted to. It basically, in some ways, Witcher 3 is just like the conduit to play Gwent, but it's still great. Now imagine if you created these big DLC packs that didn't feel like they were just hacked on, but actually felt like whole campaigns with whole landscapes all their own, because that's what Blood and Wine was. And the amount of polish and the amount of care and the beautiful landscapes, the, the depth of the world was just palpable from beginning to end. And if you are a fan of the Netflix show and you're not really sure if, you know, that whole narrative is going to go anywhere, I can tell you from having finished Wild Hunt that you are in luck because there is an actual satisfying conclusion that we have now seen for Geralt and Yennefer and Ciri. I know that this is true. <laughs> I love the fact that it has, like, a bigger player count right now than when it originally released. That's amazing. Good job, gamer community. You, you done good. And hey, it will tide you over until CD Projekt Red gets around to releasing Cyberpunk. Gonna be waiting a little bit now. 2016! Alright, look, I have to do this. My game of the year for 2016 is Stardew Valley. There. I said it. I said it! Stardew Valley may seem fairly innocuous because it's like a farming sim and it's got the pixel graphics and you might not think that much of it if you haven't actually experienced it. But it is also one of the most addictive, endless games that you can end up playing for over a hundred hours without even thinking. They actually built in some pretty complex and challenging narratives for all of the villagers in Pelican Town, and there's just an endless joy to doing this, this critical thinking problem of how you're going to arrange your day and accomplish these tasks before the sun goes down. 
And before you know it, you're going to want to turn your farm into basically an industrial villa, and you're going to be planting trees all over the place, and you're going to be exploring dungeons and running off into the desert and going to the spa and hanging out with your friends now that there's a multiplayer. And I'm telling you right now, you're going to just enjoy every moment of it because it is absolutely charming and so difficult to put down once you start. The care and the passion that Concerned Ape put into this game is seen in every single pixel. And the fact that he continues to update it to this day is a testament to how long the tale is on this title. 2017. You know, looking back on the games that were released in 2017, I realized that the top spot had to go to Prey. Now, this game might have inspired some mixed feelings when it was first announced because there was supposed to be a Prey 2 that was a follow-up to the original Prey, and we never got that game. It was canceled. People were like, I want to be a space bounty hunter, and we never got that game. So when they did this reboot, uh, people were obviously a little bit on the fence. You know, Arcane had really made a name for themselves with the Dishonored franchise, but with Prey, they created this, like, science fiction horror survival game that just always kept you glued to the screen. And the different types of creatures that they made weren't just, here's a small one, here's a larger one, here's a big one. You would deal with the little mimics that could turn into other objects. And so the second you saw two identical coffee cups next to each other, you were like, uh-oh, one of these is going to try to jump out at me. And so it kept you looking at every single thing around the screen. The larger bipedal ones would try to engage you in, like, uh, you know, face-to-face -face combat. Uh, but, you know, they would run at you. And then they had those behemoths that would basically bowl you over and kill you instantaneously, which caused you to run most of the time until you got later weaponry. It's just that every single enemy in the game tries to hit you in a different way, and so you are continuously mindful of all of the different ways this can go badly. What a beautifully atmospheric, well-told, well-executed game they built with Prey. 2018! So, it might have had its fair share of problems, which I did talk a little bit about in the video I made about it, but Red Dead Redemption 2 is still the best game of that year. They created this western storyline about outlaws seeing the end of their real time in this world, watching as things changed around them, and that desperation translates to the players. The production value is just insane. The graphics are beautiful, the sound design is amazing, the, the voice acting is top-notch, like triple-A quality from front to back. And frankly, what Rockstar created with Arthur Morgan was one of the best protagonists they have ever made for any of their games, and you cannot deny that that is quite an accomplishment. It's also a very long game. In fact, you'll think the game is over, and then there'll be, like, epilogue. And there's, like, a five-hour-long epilogue. Like, where, where'd that come from? Wow. But look, this is probably one of the most highly anticipated titles in video game history, and it did not disappoint. 2019! The year that just happened. All right, so this is a hard one because there were a lot of great games in 2019 that I have not played yet and do intend to play. I just haven't gotten there yet, so I have to work with a pretty limited pool of games. I am planning on doing a video where I just list every game released in 2019 that I played from best to worst, but I'm going to wait a little bit so that I can actually play some of those games I haven't played yet. I can tell you right now that I only really had two honorable mentions at the time I recorded this. I had Bloodstained Ritual of the Night and Borderlands 3. That, that's it, and I know that there should be a lot more than that. But I don't think it's really going to change the fact that my game of the year is The Outer Worlds. Obsidian coming in for a trifecta on this episode. Well, you know what? It was well-deserved, though. In fact, with Outer Worlds, Obsidian has truly stepped out of the shadow 
of game companies that they used to do like third party support for. And while those companies are giving us like Anthem and Fallout 76, they're creating this very rich, narratively driven, and complex role playing experience with Outer Worlds. This game has great writing, it has great world building, you get the sense that this place is indeed a dystopia, but it doesn't hammer it over your head. Instead, you get to experience that through the eyes of all of the characters. It looks great, it plays really well, it, it, the sound design is terrific, the voice acting is terrific. All of this without even a whiff of microtransactions or live service models, flying in the face of the very thing that it critiques. And there's actually very few bugs. Like, very few bugs. It's actually super solid, and you wouldn't think that I had to make mention of that in this day and age, but it's actually a very big selling point. Outer Worlds did get criticized for not being long enough, but I, I don't know. It was as long as KOTOR. In fact, it's actually more of a spiritual successor to KOTOR than it is to Fallout, because you go to a variety of different worlds, and the play area of each one is fairly small and condensed down, and it's very narratively driven, and there's multiple ways that you can deal with each objective. Oh, and you can have two NPCs follow you at any time, so yeah, it's very similar to KOTOR, actually. But that's not a bad comparison. I think the problem with that critique is that I have played some games that will last for like 100 hours, but feel like they only had about 30 hours of content that they then stretched out. I'd really just rather play a 30-hour game that feels like it was supposed to be a 30-hour game, and that is what Outer Worlds is. All the time that you spend feels like it is worthwhile time. It doesn't feel like a slog. There, There is no grind to it. There's always something new and interesting around every corner, and they do a great job in kind of true Obsidian fashion of providing this narrative where there is no real good guys or bad guys. There are all of these shades of gray in between, and you don't necessarily know what the good and just thing is and what the bad and evil thing is. And the unintended consequences of the actions that you take resonates right up until the end game. Fantastic, because that's what you hope an RPG will give you. Yeah, it's a great game overall, and if you haven't played it yet, you really should. So yeah, those were the top 10 games of the decade, at least for me, and the ones I played, obviously. If you want to find out more about the honorable mentions that I wanted to give shoutouts to, uh, those are going to be in a full written piece that I did uh, of all of this, so that you can see what I actually scripted this out as before I botched it when I got onto camera. And yeah, I probably will do a video where I actually lay out all the games I actually have played from 2019, uh, but I'm going to wait a little bit on that because I want to make sure that I actually play several that I've been looking forward to, but then I got into this whole thing where I was like, or I could just go and play New Vegas, and I haven't played those add-on DLCs for a while. So every time I'm like, oh yeah, I really should get around to playing Devil May Cry 5, I'm like, yeah, that or it could do, or I could play Honest Hearts. Oh, just waiting for me in the wings is Plague Tale Innocence. Hey, that would be great. You know what I haven't played lately? Dead Money. So as soon as I get through my comfort gaming phase, uh, I'll make sure to do those before I actually put out a list. And if you have a list of your own for your top games of each year, leave them in the comments down below. I'd be interested to see uh, how they differ from mine, because there were a few years where it's kind of touch and go. Like, I could have I could have easily swayed back to one or another, especially years like 2012, 2015. Uh, th those are really hard ones because there's so many great releases. But, you know, chances are, like, one of your favorite games from those years was actually one of my honorable mentions and uh, maybe just maybe just didn't hit there. Uh, or maybe I don't know about it yet, and now I gotta go play this game that you have told me about. So, hey, I'd be interested to find out about that. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you in the next episode. Bye, everybody.